there and welcome back. Today we're going to continue our discussion of regression models and focus in particular on dummy variables. Up to this point, the variables of our regression models have only been continuous numerical random variables. So one can ask, what if I want to include categorical variables into my model in some way? The solution, or an easy solution to that, is what we call dummy variables, which some people also call indicator variables. And what these variables are is ones that typically take on a finite number of variables and are typically, but not necessarily, associated to categorical variables within our model. So to sort of start things off, let's look at a particular example that you might want to include in terms of modeling. So let us assume that we want to model happiness. And let's assume that happiness is defined on a continuous spectrum, say from 0 to 100, or something similar to that. And let's assume that we have another variable, x1. Let's assume that this is annual salary. And let's assume that we want to see if there's a linear or some type of relationship between annual salary and happiness. And again, annual salary can be defined on a continuous spectrum from, say, 0 to positive infinity, let's assume. And what I want to do is I want to define a new variable. I'm going to call it z for now. And let's assume that this is the highest education level earned. Now, one could, of course, argue that maybe highest education level earned and and annual salary are possibly dependent variables, or maybe these two variables are highly correlated with each other. So um, maybe using these two variables to explain um, the relationship on happiness probably isn't the best choice. But for now, let's just assume that these are independent variables. We will talk about you know how to deal with correlated variables in our model a little bit later. So now let's just assume that x1 and z are independent variables. Now, the difference between this variable x1 and this new variable z is that x1 is a numerical variable and z, at least in its current stage, is a categorical variable. And let's assume that we can break this z category into four different states. Let's assume that the first category state is going to be, let's assume, high school. So the highest amount of uh, education that someone has finished, let's assume, is high school. Another situation, let's assume, for example, is an undergraduate degree, like a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree or something in that realm. Let's assume also a graduate degree, like a master's or maybe a PhD. And let's assume that they've done some postgraduate work as well. You can include several other categories into this structure if you want, but I'm just going to keep these four just for now. So notice that we have k is equal to four values for which this variable z can take, but they're not numerical values, they are categorical variables. So what we want to do is we want to what some people call recode. So recode z into some numerical form in terms of variables. And these are what we're going to be calling dummy variables. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define the variable z1. So z1 is going to take the value 1 if z is equal to high school. And it's going to take the value 0 otherwise. So, for example, um, if you finish undergraduate at most, graduate at most, or postgrad at most, um, then z1 would be equal to 0. Let's define a new variable z2. So z2 is going to be equal to 1 if z is undergraduate and 0 otherwise. And let's define z3 to be equal to 1 if z is graduate and zero otherwise. Now, I'm not actually going to keep this definition as so, because what I can do is I can define zero to be postgraduate. Right? Therefore, every single case, high school, undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate, has a unique representation in terms of these variables z1, z2, and z3. Notice that originally I had four values for my categories, and notice I have represented those four values at, in terms of k minus 1, in particular three variables. And these variables are dummy variables, because they represent sort of a numerical representation of those discrete categorical variables that we sort of are trying to model, right? And this group here, that is sort of like the default one, is usually what we refer to as our reference group.
Now this is not the only way that you can code these variables. For example, you can assign Z2 to high school. You can assign Z3 to um, undergraduate if you want. You can also create um, some other variables. For example, Z1 is equal to, you know, you can do Z1 is equal to negative one, zero, and one. For example, high school, undergraduate, or other, and for example, you can do Z2 to be equal to one and zero to be equal to graduate and postgraduate. That would also work, but typically speaking, we want these variables to be as distinct and separate as possible so that, you know, everything's sort of accounted for. So the ideal case is if you have four values for a category, then you're going to have k minus one different dummy variables associated to that. So if this is our particular model, what would our multiple linear regression model look like? So we have our y value here, we have our intercept beta zero, and then we have beta one x, so beta one x, one, All right? So that's our explanatory variable associated to, for example, annual salary, right? And then we have beta two and Z one, and then beta three, Z two, and data beta four, Z three, so those are our dummy variables. So dummy variables for education. And lastly, we have our residual term. All right. Well, let's not forget, let's not, let's just label our intercepts so they don't feel lonely. All right. And that would be our new multiple regression model. And you can, you know, execute the normal procedure in terms of finding these coefficients, beta one, beta two, beta three, and beta four, and do a hypothesis on that. Now, I just want to formally state, um, you know, how many dummy variables should you define and when you should define them. So if you have one categorical variable with k categories. And of course you can have more than one categorical variable, but each of those categorical variables would satisfy this similar property. So if beta zero is not equal to zero, i.e. you want there to be an intercept in your model, then that means you need k minus one dummy variables for that particular category. And if you want your model to not have an intercept, and sometimes that's perfectly fine, there's some situations where that may be appropriate. Uh, in that situation, you need k dummy random variables, or dummy variables. They're, of course, random, of course. So dummy variables. Now, why am I allowed to include another variable when I don't have an intercept? Because remember, for that reference group term, for that last random variable, that needs to be represented by something. So in terms of these variables, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z1 entirely encapsulates high school, Z2 entirely encapsulates undergraduate, Z3 entirely uh, encapsulates graduate school, and the other variables, for example, X1, and also the vertical intercept, in addition to the error term, but we usually don't talk about that, is encapsulating the properties associated to the postgraduate category. But when you lose that intercept, then you don't really sort of have something that sort of represents that remaining category. Um, so that's sort of another reason why, um, if you do not have an intercept, then you can use k dummy variables in that particular sense. Um, because in a sense, that new last dummy variable would be uh, associated to your intercept of your model. Now that we have introduced uh, what a dummy variable is and how many dummy variables we would want for a particular categorical variable or possibly multiple categorical variables, let's look at a couple examples and sort of see um, how we would conduct uh, multiple regression models for particular models that include categorical variables in our study. Let us assume that you're going to be interested in studying the relationship or the existence of a relationship between the average amount of sleep an individual gets per night and the connection between that and, for example, gender or possibly some other categorical variable that you may be interested in studying. So for this example, what I want to do is I want to define x to be equal to one of two categories. Let's assume we define x to be equal to one if our respondent is female. And let's define it to be zero 
if our category is male. Notice that gender, at least in our assumptions, is going to be taking two categories, therefore we will only be defining one dummy variable, in particular two minus one dummy variables, for this particular model. All right? Again, if you want to include more than two categories, for example female, male, and whatever other classifications you want to include in that model, then you would have to include, for example, k minus one dummy variables in your um, model representation. So once we have that, what will we have? Well, that means our model is just simply going to be equal to y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x plus our error term epsilon. Right? So it's a very simple linear regression model. Um, and keep in mind, again, since we're only working with two categories, we're going to be working with one variable in this model. And keep in mind, this is not our typical predictor random variable. It is a dummy variable because it only can take these two discrete values. Now what we need to do is go out and gather some samples. So let's assume we gather a sample. We only ask them two questions. What is your gender? And on average, how much time do you sleep per night? So let's assume we ask three males, and these are their responses. So let's assume the responses for 5.6, 4.3, and 6.1. And let's assume that we ask four females. So female, 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 and female. And let's assume these are the responses. So 5.8, 5.7, 4.9, and 6.2. So that's our data. Okay, so what do we define x to be? Well, by our definition, we're going to be defining 0 if male and 1 if female. That means all of these values, male, these are actually equal to 0, and these are all equal to 1. So you can find the average of the x values, average of the y values, the standard deviations, and so on. In particular, one should be able to find that these estimates for our parameters, beta 0 and beta 1, are given by beta hat 0. That's going to be equal to 5.33. And the slope of our model is approximately equal to 0 0.32. And if you don't remember how to get those parameters, remember, at least for the simple linear regression model, beta hat 1 is going to be r times the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x. And beta 0 hat, that's going to be equal to y bar minus the slope of our vertical intercept times x bar. Once we work in, of course, multiple linear regression model, it's recommended that you're going to be working in the linear algebra perspective um, for simplicity purposes, of course. So now that we have our model, we should be able to calculate our typical ANOVA table metrics. For example, SSE, SSM, MSE, MSM, and uh, MST and SST. So remember that once you get those models, the F-test statistic is going to be equal to the MSM divided by the MSE, i.e. the mean square error for our model and the mean square error for our residual term. And you should be able to find through those procedures and typical calculations that that's going to be approximately equal to 0.32. Since we're working in the simple linear regression model, also remember that this is actually going to be equal to the associated test statistic for T distribution squared. Right? And that's just some special things. Now, since we have an F-test statistic, we should be able to calculate a p-value for that. So the p-value you can find, that's going to be approximately equal to 0 0.5914. In most scenarios, that is usually considered to be large. Right? Because usually people use an alpha value for 0 0.05, and that's substantially larger than 5%. Right. So since our p-value is not less than a typical alpha value, that means what? So that means we're going to be failing to reject the null hypothesis because our p-value typically is not going to be low enough um, for rejection. And the null hypothesis that we are going to be rejecting is the claim that the beta 1 term, the slope of our linear regression model, is equal to 0. So we're failing to reject that. That means we have evidence to believe that beta 1 is equal to 0. So what exactly does that mean? That means there is no significant difference between the groups we analyzed with respect to sleep. Right? So we can actually represent this in terms of another null hypothesis that we definitely should be uh, familiar with. So this is equivalent to the null hypothesis that the mean amount of sleep for males and the mean amount of sleep for females are equal to each other. And again, we're still failing to reject this 
that they are equal to each other. Because if we reject it, that means we have evidence to believe that they are different, but since we are failing to reject it, that means we have evidence to believe that they are the same. And notice we were able to conduct this hypothesis test via a simple linear regression model. Let's look at another example to sort of demonstrate the same procedure. For our next example, suppose we want to see if there's a significant difference between the lifespans of squirrels that are in the wild versus the lifespan of squirrels that are in captivity. So from the general hypothesis perspective, what we're seeking to reject or fail to reject, depending on what your motivations are, is that the average lifespan for wild squirrels is significantly different than the average lifespan of those in captivity. All right. So Let's assume that we do not want to approach this via the t-test perspective. Um, let's assume that we want to test this via regression. All right. So what are we going to do? So the first thing that we need to do is define our categories. So a squirrel, at least from this discussion, is going to be broken into two categories, either wild or captivity. So since our categorical variable the type of squirrel that we're working with, is broken into k is equal to two types. That means we need one dummy random variable defined in our linear regression model. So how are we going to define it? So we're going to define x to be equal to, let's do zero for wild squirrel, and let's do one for not wild squirrel, which of course includes our captivity squirrels. Okay, so once we have this, that means an equivalent linear regression model is going to be equal to y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 hat, or just beta 1, x1, plus our error term. Okay, so again, simple linear regression model, so if you don't know multiple linear regression, then you should be able to do this still. So let's first off gather our data. Okay, so x and y. So let's look at, for example, the average lifespan for wild squirrels, right? So wild squirrels will take the value of zero. So let's assume we are able to sample four, so again, this is wild squirrels, and their average lifespans were, let's assume, 5.8, 6.2, 3.1, 5.9. For our captivity squirrels, let's assume we sampled six of them. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is my captivity squirrels. Let's assume that their average lifespans were 1.2, 2.6, 1.8, 2.5, 1.4, and 2.1. So that is our data. So once you have your data, then now we construct our estimates for beta 0 and beta 1. Now keep this in mind. We are assuming that all of the assumptions of our linear model are met. That includes linearity of the means. That includes the homocedasticity assumption. That also includes independence of our responses of our y variables. It includes all of those assumptions. So again, if those assumptions are not met, then it's not appropriate to be using a linear model. So you show you should be using all of your typical model assumption diagnostic tests, for example, looking at your standardized residual plots and all of those things. So keep that in mind. So once we do that, and let's assume that our linear model is appropriate, then one can find that the approximation for a beta zero hat is equal to 5.25, and the approximation for the slope of our line is approximately equal to negative 3.32. So that is our predicted model. So if I were to take a model, what is the predicted lifespan um, for that particular squirrel type, you, this model would be able to give you that answer. Uh, more importantly, let's calculate our F-test statistic. You should be able to find, and if you want to try and find it, um, definitely pause this video and see if you can. Um, but you should be able to find that it's going to be equal to 26.79, which is just going to be generating a p-value of approximately 0.00085, okay? And keep in mind that's associated to an f distribution with 1 comma n minus 1 minus 1 degrees of freedom, right? Because remember, that's the number of predictor variables or variables in our model. And again, that's going to be p minus 1 as usual, okay? Um, keep that in mind just in case you want to extend that to example the multiple linear regression case.
Now, what do we have here? So that typically is going to be very small, right? Again, a lot of people use 5%, but notice 5% would be 0 0.05. So even if you were to use 1%, um, we would still be rejecting the null hypothesis in this particular scenario. Um, so for general practical purposes, what will we do? So that means we will be rejecting the null hypothesis that beta one is equal to zero, which is equivalent to rejecting the null hypothesis that the mean lifespan for wild squirrels is equal to the mean lifespan for squirrels in captivity. So notice that we are conducting a test on the equality of means via a test on the zero values of the coefficients in our linear model. So if that is the case, that means there is a statistical difference between the lifespans between these categories. And then you can make of that what you want and make your policies or make change or look into it a little bit further if that is cause for concern. All right. So that is just a brief introduction to dummy variables and how they can be used, both to model uh, categorical variables and a linear regression model. And I've kept these examples very small because I don't want you to sort of get lost in the multiple linear regression model case. But you definitely can do this, for example, with um, three continuous variables, um, five uh, dummy random variables, of course, you combat a little bit of requirements for that sample size because, you know, the more variables you have, you definitely need a lot more uh, data points to sort of represent all those dimensions. Um, but generally speaking, you can have as many dummy variables as you want, as many uh, continuous variables as you want. And we also see that this is actually equivalent to testing the equalities of means, both for two variables, but you can also do it for several more. But we're going to spend a lot of time on that a little bit later. But until then, take care. Mm -hmm.